So this is an interesting season, as we all know, 2024. Let's, let's, you know what, let's give God a round of applause for getting us to 2024. Because we can give ourselves all the pats on the back we want. But if it wasn't in God's plan, you wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't. None of us would. You want to talk about grace and mercy? The fact that you're here today is proof that God lives, that he's real, and that he reigns. You know, I was so excited when uh, God confirmed the word for this year, the year of the dressing of the bride. And I'm like, as a man, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because we don't see ourselves through that lens, but Christ calls him, he is the groom, the church is the bride. Amen. And so God is doing something in each of us this year that he has not done to this degree. So God has already done a lot of stuff in your life. Yes. Praise the Lord. And we've probably muddled things up a little bit, but you know, God turns things around because that's what God does. But understanding that you're the bride, he's going to do something very unique this year. And he's dressing us in three ways. In purity, faith, and power. Amen. Purity, faith, and power. That's what's going to be different about 2024 than 2023. See, I don't know if you guys remember, but in 2023, it was the year of heaven's invasion or an invasion of heaven. That means that God is going to intersect your life, interfere with some of your stuff, get involved with some of your stuff, some of the stuff you'd allowed him, some of the stuff you'd not allowed him to do. But in 2024, God says, now I'm going to start building my kingdom inside of you. Amen. See, I did it on the outside last year, but this year, it's my kingdom in you. It's me really purifying my bride. But that purification is a process, and it is not easy. You know, I was, as I continued to process uh, this word for this year, the message for today, God reminded me that this process, this year, this journey, is a call to spiritual purity and a call to war. This is a season where you're going to fight from the inside out and not the outside in. See, last year, all these voices, all these options, because obviously this generation is, we're inundated with options. It's so crazy, right? Advertisements have advertisements that have advertisements. There's always something that's being put out there. But this year, it's going to be from the inside out. You're going to push out the stuff. You're going to identify the stuff from the outside, and you're not going to let it in anymore. Amen. See, that's what purity does. Purity does not make room for impurity. So what God is doing, because he's coming back, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, in the book of Revelations, it talks about how God is going to come back for one specific bride, one particular church. It's his pure, faithful bride. So if we're not pure from the inside out, we can look cute and be all that in a bag of chips, but if inside we are rotting and we're dying and we're faking and we're pretending, but we're not really living it, God knows. And the truth is that the world will also know. They'll know that the church is counterfeit and it's not authentic. And so I really believe that 2024 is the year where the kingdom of God is going to break through in you. It's about the kingdom in you. See, last year was about the outside demonstration of God, the outside get out of jail free cards, the outside situations where God just got involved and he just yanked you out of situations that we found ourselves in. But this is the year where God's going to redefine you from the inside out. The kingdom of God in you. As we were worshiping, and I was so happy to see uh, our young ladies worshiping. Because they got to step in in, in in an uncertain opportunity. And they got to step out in faith. And I was looking at the girls before they, they, they worshiped today. And I said, you know, that's like me every Sunday. Hallelujah. God bless you. I don't know, I don't know what God's going to say in a service. I have some basic thoughts, but everything else is all God. And even those thoughts God gave me today, he doesn't give them to me like a week ahead or a month ahead. God gives it to me fresh. Wow. And that gives me a thought that I want to share with you that God gave me three days ago in the gym. And it reminded me of the people of Israel when they traveled through the desert. And in those travels, they were so hungry. They were so lost. But they were trusting God. And they begged Moses for manna. 
for food, heavenly food. Heavenly food at that point was called manna. I want you to know today that as God builds his kingdom inside of you, that he's giving you manna today. Amen. The manna is Amen. the word of God. Yes. Every day you can eat as much as you want. This is one buffet that won't get you, well, you won't gain weight. You might gain spiritual weight, but you won't gain natural weight. But that's really what we have to understand. This is our manna. If we don't get fed spiritually, it's impossible for us to function, right, in that authority. It's, it's impossible to move in power when, you're, when every situation wants you to cower. But when you spend time in the word of God and you get fed every day, we're still eating manna today. You and I have the opportunity to the word of God to be fed every day. Amen. You don't have to starve. Your future doesn't have to be deprived. Your destiny no longer has to be delayed. But you do have to feed yourself. You know, even when God brought the manna, the manna was like, these, like this honeycomb almost type of, of wafers that would grow up out of, the, out, of, out of the ground every single day. And people were only allowed to give, get what they needed. In other words, it was sustenance. Do you know the word of God is your sustenance? Without the word of God, you cannot be sustained. You can fake it. But you won't survive. You need the sustenance to pass the test. You need the sustenance to get to those places that God needs to take you to. Yeah. And the truth is, and this is what's so amazing about God, is that he's already given you what previous generations didn't have, which is his word. Imagine being Moses or Joshua or Paul or Silas or all these other individuals other than Jesus because Jesus has had a hard line to God. Amen? But imagine not having all of this. Imagine if Paul had the entire word of God. Paul would be like, excuse me, I'm going to go back to the page. Yeah, 1,672. Yep, that's exactly what I need. He would, he would use this and apply it every day. All of these great fathers and women of faith. We had Esther's too. We have Deborah's that were judges. All of these people would have referenced this manual without skipping a beat. But it's crazy how today... The kingdom of the world is trying to take over the kingdom of God. And it's because we won't feed ourselves with his manna. It is crazy that I, I, this is one constant that I have encountered, especially with men. And I'm knocking, I'm not knocking my brothers, so don't be throwing nothing at me. Uh, but it's that a lot of men share with me, you know what, I just don't like to read. And I'm like, oh my gosh. You know, Pastor, it's just that I fall asleep when I start reading. I'm like, man, if I told you that the word of God was what's going to get you to heaven and save your marriage, save your future, save your finances, save your soul, wouldn't you have a little bit of passion and commitment to reading the word of God and, and getting fed with his manna? Yeah. Guys, we Christians, and this is the greatest tragedy, and I don't know if you guys remember, I, we, had, we had watched a, a, a movie about death and at the movie theaters. I can't remember the topic, and it doesn't really matter. But it's about life after death. It's about people having experiences after death or on the operating table where they get physically come out of their bodies. And in that, it led me to discover a video on YouTube about a gentleman in his 80s that was testifying to his own personal visitation by God. And in it, he says that in a window of, I don't know if it was 15 or 20 minutes, he saw 1,950 people get rejected at the pearly gates and only 50 people made it in. Hear what I'm saying? That's for the entire world. 1,950 people made it just to the gates. And of the people that were so convinced that they were getting in, only 50, so out of 2,000, only 50 made it in. I really believe that if we don't begin to understand and appreciate what the manna is, a lot of people that think they're getting in are going to be locked out. That is scary. Because what's happening is we've learned how to feed ourselves with substitutes, with things that make us feel good, things that feed our flesh and starve our souls. But today, God, is he's bringing us into this whole kingdom reality, this, the, the, the ministry is called Kingdom Arise Church. Well, guess what? In 2024, the kingdom is arising in you. The kingdom is arising in you. This is different than the other years, I'm telling you right now. Because the kingdom of God is arising in you. It's nice when the kingdom of God is around you, but you can't take that with you. But when the kingdom of God is arising in you, the kingdom goes everywhere you go. Even when you're alone. Even when you hurt. 
Even when you're sad, even when you're depressed, even when every person that loves you or says they love you, they said, why do you serve your God? Why do you believe your God? You know what? You know why? Because the kingdom of God is arising in me. It's rising in me. Every day as I get up, God has given me the guts. God has given me the strength. He's feeding me in the morning with the matter so that I can go to war. Every day is a battle. But the church doesn't want to tell people that. It's a battle out there. And as I, you know, I often heard over the years, I am too blessed to be stressed. I'm saying, you are a liar. Stress comes with a blessing. To learn how to steward your life, to take care of your soul, to take care of the souls that God's trusted you with, to take care of your finances, to take care of your home, all of those things require, are going to be encountered with something called opposition. Opposition will absolutely incur some degree of stress. If you have no stress in your life, I wonder if you have a pulse. <laughs> Straight up. Even unsaved people are stressed, okay? Stress is, is an equalizer. Just like death in Texas. It's an equalizer. I'm telling you, it's an equalizer. But when you understand that, then you say, man, I need to tap into something that's bigger than me. That is where you and I get to step into in 24 and allow God to dress you as his pure bride. God is changing your outfit. God is changing your gear. He's changing your flow. He's changing your look. He's changing your life. And when you understand that all of a sudden your approach changes, all of a sudden your mindset changes. So God continued to speak to me today. It's crazy how he has downloads on me on Sunday mornings. He told me that 2024 is a year to shake off, shift, and shine. Shake off. Shift and shine. Amen. He also confirmed, and it's going to be confirmed when we read in the book of Acts today, that Paul modeled to us how to shake things off because he shook them off. Scripture says it. He shifted places. He shifted environments. He shifted friends. He shifted companions. But at the end of the day, God shined through his life. And God today wants to do the same with you and I. Paul's no better than you and I. Paul is actually part of heaven's host. And right now, heaven's host is watching you and I today. They have front row seats from heaven and they're looking at you and I today. And they're like, just get it. Just go for it. Trust God. Let God build his kingdom, not around you, but from the inside out. Because all lasting change starts from the inside out. You know, the most disappointing reality is when you realize you can't be fixed from the outside in. It's crazy how the world wants to market to us how if we do something on the outside, radically, our lives are going to change from the inside. It doesn't work like that. All lasting change happens from the inside out. We have to do that. And that's, that's what requires faith. That's what requires trust. That's what requires us to trust God and allow him to purify us, the broken places, the, shame, the guilty places, the dirty places, the places that we're ashamed of, the failures. God doesn't see failure. He, in his lens, through his divine eyes, he sees feedback. Learn, daughter. Learn, son. It's, it was, it's not, wasn't a setback. It was a setup. See, God doesn't look through, look through you and I with negative eyes, but with a loving heart. You know, it doesn't matter if your child is a, is a little angel, and I, excuse the, 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 the example, we're an angel or not so angelic. You're going to love your child no matter what because they came from you. Yes. You've come from God and you're going back to him. The faster that you get it, the faster that we get this man and the faster that we let him to start doing the hard work on the inside, everything changes. But if you don't change, nothing changes. Amen? God's kingdom is arising in you. God also reminded me that God is forming his kingdom within you before it can shine through you. You can't shine if, you, if you're not transformed. You know, as we began the church, I remember this one thought God placed heavy on my heart. God doesn't want a church of transformers. He wants a church transformed. Hear what I'm saying. A lot of people are one person in church and there's somebody else on the street. There's somebody else at home. 
they're not the same person. So we've learned how to adapt and adjust to the environments instead of us being consistent with who we are in Christ. And then we stay transformed. Are we perfect? No, we're not perfect. But it is a perfecting process. Amen. And so I just want to encourage us as we go to 2024. I know this is more than just a regular message, but I, I think we have to also use broad strokes as we step into this year of 2024 and catch the vision of what God has for us this year. I'm going to be reading out of Acts 18, verses 1 through 17, out of the message translation. And then we will be closing in Psalms chapter 66, verses 1 through 20 in the NLT, which is the New Living Translation. Amen. Amen. You know, as I approach this particular situation that we find our good friend, an example, Paul in, is God asked me this question and I want to pose it to all of you today. Will you praise him in the process? Will you really praise him in the process? Will you praise him when you're alone in the car? Will you praise him when you're in the gym? Will you praise him when you're going for a walk? Will you praise him before you eat? Will you praise him when you're sitting next to your child? Will you praise him even if the situations or circumstances are not what you expected? Because the truth is, is that the situation and the circumstances are never what you expect. Welcome to the human race. So what the beauty of Paul, as we step into this portion of the book of Acts, is that we're going to find that Paul did two things. He always prayed and he always praised. He prayed and he praised. I want you to know something, that if you take it a step further, not that Paul didn't do this as well, that if you will pray and praise, that you will also slay. You will slay things, things that have been around for a very long time, even for generations, if you will pray in praise, God will be sure to slay those things that have tried to torment you or the generations before you. This is our season. We got to get through this today. So let's open up and let's read together out of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18, verse 1. Once again, this is in the message translation. It says that Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all the Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers just as he was. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue, trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike. And after silence and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes. We're talking about shaking something off? Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, your blood is upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles. And then he left. And he went home to the home of Titus Justus, a Gentile who worshipped God and lived next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers, and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. Somebody needs to highlight that in the Bibles. For I am with you, and no one will attack and harm you. For many people in this city, in this world, in this generation belong to me. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half, teaching the word of God. But when Gal Galileo became governor of Achaia, some Jews rose up together against Paul and brought him before the governor for judgment. They accused Paul of persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to our law. But just as Paul started to make his defense, Galileo turned to Paul's accusers and he said, Listen, you Jews, if there were a case involving some wrongdoing or a serious 
crime, I would have reason to accept your case. But since it's merely a question of words and names and your Jewish law, take care of it yourselves. I refuse to judge such matters. And he threw them out of the courtroom. The crowd then grabbed Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and they beat him right there in the courtroom. But Galileo paid no attention. Amen. Amen. So this is an interesting portion of scripture. And for those who are not aware, God has had us on a journey through the book of Acts. And before the book of Acts, he had us go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Verse by verse, line by line, chapter by chapter. So we are continuing this progression that God started since the church started. So in these four and a half years, now we're in the half part, we are going into the fifth year, and God has us in the book of Acts. Amen? And so that's where we find ourselves. And one thing you're going to find about all of this process that our good friend Paul finds himself in is that he always prays and he prayed. Praises and praise. And so that's very powerful for you because he gets rejected in a lot of places. There's nothing up there right now. That's fine. Just leave it there. But I'm just saying, focus on what I'm saying. You today are going to have to praise when you don't want to. And you're going to have to pray when you need to, regardless of whether you're aware of it or not. The Bible says that the prayer of the fervent prevaileth much. That means that you pray. Another scripture says, pray without ceasing. That means you never stop. See, prayer is the oxygen of the soul. Did you know that? Prayer is the oxygen of our soul. So when we pray, our soul gets fed. When we pray, we stay connected to God. The less that you pray, the less connected you'll be. It's interesting how when you have a parent that you love, you typically will call them frequently. Well, how much more should you love God? How much more do you want to talk to God? How much would you, more would you want to talk to God if you knew that the God that you're speaking to is the God that opens up the door of destiny to you every single day? Every single time that you don't know what to do, he'll tell you what to do. Why? Because he'll share with you because he's also known as the wonderful counselor. And so today, as we step into the book of Acts, I just want people to have the backstory. Paul has been in and out of prison. He's almost been killed. He has been stoned. He's been torn apart. He's been whipped by the cat and nine tails multiple times. He finds himself in prison five different times in his lifetime, and every single time it is not a joyride. It is not, he's not going to Ritz-Carlton. He's not going on vacation. He is dealing with some serious stuff, but he never stops praising, and he never stops praying. Amen? Now let's take a closer look at this portion of Scripture. It says that Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. Paul has been all over the place. God called him to Macedonia. God called Paul to stop preaching just to the Jews and to start reaching the world. When Paul leaves, in this progression, God calls him to Macedonia. Macedonia is Europe. And now he finds himself in Athens, which is Greece. So he's been working all these areas, and now he's in the area of Corinth, or that's where we find the Church of Corinthians, or the Book of Corinthians. Amen? It says, there he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila. Born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome. So I've seen people, deportation has been happening for a very long time. I don't know if you know that, but now you do. <laughs> slavery has been around for a very long time. People don't realize that, but slavery exists today. Naturally, but also spiritually. See, 2024 is going to be a big deal because this is the year that you're being dressed by God. And as he dresses you in purity, what's going to happen is that people are going to come out of captivity. So understand that slavery in our family, slavery in our lives, places of torment, places of torture, places of disappointment, those places are leaving your life because God is clothing you. He's taking off the gray, dark, tattered clothes, the holy clothes, the messy clothes, the embarrassing clothes, the hidden clothes, and he's going to give you nice, beautiful, white, righteous clothes that he is designed for you. It says that Paul lived and worked with them for they were tent makers as he was. I love that we find that Paul is not looking for the Ritz Carlton. He's not looking for the best accommodations. He finds himself amongst refugees. Most people, when they go to reach a people, don't try to hook up with a refugee to, get, to build a life with or to start a ministry with. See, God will have you do things that don't make sense. See, in the natural, what Paul did made no sense. 
If you and I today were to go find ourselves in another country, the last place you'd want to go with or the last people you'd tend to want to go be hosted by would be a refugee, right? See, refugees usually don't live in a lap of luxury. Refugees are oftentimes not received by the community because they were placed there because they were rejected from somewhere else. So imagine the heart of God through Paul. And he says, Paul, I don't want you to go and stay with that wealthy, rich family. I don't want that Jewish rabbi to host you. I want you to go find a refugee that also labored like you labor, and I want you to do life with them. I don't want you to have, I don't want you to experience the lap of luxury. I want you to experience true humanity. God will always humble you to keep you humble, to keep you connected to his heart, not to punish you. Hear what I'm saying? Oftentimes, when we find ourselves in very humbling situations, we feel like God's rejected us. God didn't reject Paul, and God's not rejecting you. God didn't reject Jesus. God was preparing our hearts for the call to the mission field. God was keeping Paul humble so that Paul would need God. Today, God is keeping you humble, and I don't know what part of your life he's humbling you in, but the truth is that that area of your life is something that's a treasure to God. And that area of your life is what he's going to utilize to get to your heart, to chisel away at the hard parts of your heart, to chisel away at the plan that you had that God says is not the best plan for you. It's a good plan, but it's not a God plan. So God is humbling Paul. I want you to see this because you can read through this and you'd be like, I can, you can do, whole, I call it holy speed reading, right? When we blast through this and we're like, dude, okay, he stayed with uh, Pr Priscilla and Aquila. Oh, that's cool. No, he stayed with refugees. Why would you send Paul, the greatest apostle in the New Testament, to stay with refugees? Because God has a heart for the lost. He has a heart for the down and out. He has a heart for your humanity. He has a heart for the messy lives or the reality of our messy lives. And God's not scared of it. So that's good for you and I. So we can be like Paul and have a heart like Paul and respond like Paul by praising and praying. Three, Paul lived, well, let's go back to three. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers just as he was. If you ever want to know, that's some trivia, uh, you know, tent makers. Paul was a tent, uh, or, yeah, Paul had a background in tent making. I had no idea. Did you know that? He was a tent maker, and he was a real good one. Praise the Lord. Let's keep going. Each Sabbath, Paul found, was found at the synagogue trying to convince Jews and Greeks alike. So right now we're finding out that Paul at this point is bivocational. That means he, is, he has a regular job. He's pulling his own weight, weight and making his own wages. And in his free time, all he does is serve God and he's evangelizing, meaning he's reaching out and trying to convince Jews and Greeks alike. In other words, Paul doesn't discriminate. I don't care if you're a refugee. I don't care if you're a Roman. I don't care if you're a Jew. I don't care where you're from. All I know is that you have a heartbeat and you have a desperate need for God. Five. And after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia. So backstory, Silas and Timothy were, had already been with Paul. They had been on this fantastic journey. The truth is, is that many times there were groups of people that wanted to stone Paul. So they had to sneak Paul out of cities many, many times. Not just one time, not just two times, but many times. And so finally, as Paul has snuck off and escaped, now finally his, his, his assistants, his armor bearers, some other disciples have finally caught up to him. Because they were able to leave those situations in those cities because they weren't the ones that were going to get stoned. He was. So now they've caught up to Paul. It says, after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. They said, tag, we got you, Paul. You go ahead and you, you testify, you preach the word of God, and we'll take care of the rest. Don't worry about the roof over your head. Don't worry about the food on the table. We got you. We got you. We love you, and we support you in any which way we can. So what does Paul do? He just serves God even more. It says that he testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. See, the world wasn't really, really was not challenged with the idea that Jesus was the Messiah. It was the Jews that had a real issue with it. See, they, Jesus wasn't the, the Messiah they expected. So Paul had a heart to reach those who had the promise but didn't understand who the promise keeper was. See, they wanted the promise. They wanted eternity. They were God's promised people, but they didn't recognize Jesus. And so his first assignment was to let the Jews know who God really was and really is. And his name is Jesus. Let's keep going. 
It says, but when the opposing insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and he said, your blood is upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles. Do not move. This is a shift in the ministry of Paul. Paul says, I'm done. It's amazing how if you go to another portion of scripture, God has invested in Moses for 40 years. He's invested in him, actually, for a lifetime. But he gets to a point where he says, Moses, you can't go any further. He says, tag, you're not it. And he turns directly to Joshua and he says, tag, you're it. All of a sudden, in this scripture, in the book of Acts, and this is the New Testament church. Guys, this is God starting the church for the first time on the face of the earth. Before this, it was all Jews and, and, and Judaism and the temples. This is the first time that we're building Christians. This is the first time that we're building the New Testament church. This is us, right? But he says, I, so he says, basically, I'm done with you. Done. That Paul says, I'm not going to minister to you and your kids and your kids' kids or your cities or your communities or your synagogues anymore. I'm done. Guys, this is a big shift in Paul's ministry. Paul is now shifting his focus and his heart and his mission to preach to who? The Gentiles. That's you and I today. Because they made no room for Jesus, Jesus made room for us. Hear what I'm saying. I know that it sounds like they made the decision, but God already knew the outcome before they ever made their decisions. You know, every time that situations happen, you're like, I don't understand why it happened. It must have, God knew it was going to happen. God just turned it around. See, God makes all things work for the good of those called according to his purposes. Before you knew that you were born on purpose, for a purpose, with a purpose, God had knew you. God had formed you. God had plans for you. He had plans for your kids and your kids, kids, kids. God had plans for you to touch this generation. God had a plan before there was ever a plan because God is God. We're tapped into something so big it's insane. But this is the time in the church history that Paul says, I'm done. I'm now focusing my heart and my energy and my life to the Gentiles, to the church, to the non-Jews. Let's keep going. It says that he left and he went home to the home of Titius Justus, a Gentile who worshipped God and lived next door to the synagogue. So up until this point, he was typically hosted by Jews. Now he's not. Now he's going to the home of a Gentile who worshipped God. Guys, if you want God to come to your house, if you want people that serve God to come to your house, yes, be a God worshipper. Amen? It's not that complicated. But you have to be, have a life of worship. And the gentleman happened to live next door to the synagogue. So literally everybody that he preached to that rejected him is literally walking past him as he's staying in the house next door. Let's keep going. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue. So this is the head that oversaw the synagogue. And everyone in his house believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul and became believers and were baptized. So even though Paul was done, God wasn't. I want you to know that sometimes you're done with the situation, God's not. Sometimes what happens is that the minute that you let go of being God through the situation, then God can actually be the God in that situation. Yeah. One of the hardest things to do as a person, as a human being, is trying to hold on to a situation that you can't fix. And you just got to let it go. And you have to trust God. I love that the minute that Paul lets go, then God gets to flow. He says, Paul, you've done what you've done and you've been faithful and you've been obedient. This is a test of your will. Will you still serve these people? Will you still reach these people? But at this point now, I'm going to reach them. Let's keep going. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid. Guys, this is a beautiful portion of scripture. You should highlight it if you have it, your Bibles around, but highlight that. What God says to Paul in a vision is such a beautiful prophetic promise. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Guys, part of faith is not the absence of fear. It's having faith in the midst of fear. Okay, when you have faith, it's not because you're not scared. It's just because you trust your God to be bigger than your circumstances. You trust God to be greater than the surgeon. You trust God to be bigger than the relationship. You trust God to be bigger than your bank account. You trust God just to be bigger than anything because God truly is bigger than all things. So we have to really, as we build God's kingdom inside of us and it rises up inside of us, we have to start with slaying fear. And how do you do that? Walk in faith. 
Paul kept going as he needed to go. He didn't stay there and dilly-dally. He didn't complain. He didn't billy act. He's like, God, I got to get out of here. I got to go through the back door. You're going to drop me out of a basket outside a city wall. Whatever you got to do so they don't stone me and kill me, perfect. I'm not afraid. I'm just going to follow you. God also commands Paul to do this. Speak out. God says a prophetic word to the church. I want you to know that. God is saying, the first thing he's telling you every single day, stop being afraid. Don't be afraid. Say, don't be afraid. Say, don't be afraid. Say, don't be afraid. Say, I am not afraid. Say, I'm not afraid. Say, I'm not afraid. I will no longer be afraid. I will no longer be afraid because I am taking authority because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Fear is leaving. Fear is going to leave your home today. Some of you guys, you can't even sleep at night. You're so scared. And you don't even know why. Because it's a spirit. Fear is a spirit. Speak out. Guys, that's a second note to self. You can highlight that. You can write it on your forehead. Whatever. Speak out. Guys, don't stay quiet anymore. Sometimes your silence is what gives permission for certain things not to change. When you have the guts to open your mouth, that's when the atmosphere changes, not when you keep your mouth shut. Sometimes you got to say what is not popular. I know because I've been very unpopular in my family in this certain circles of my life. That's okay. I'd rather be loved by God than liked by man. But that is a hard lesson in life to learn. Because it's very easy for us to want everybody. If you look at social media today, social media, it's all about getting the likes. It's all about these pretend friends that we have. All these people that, oh yeah, I got like five million followers. How many do you hang out with? None. Okay, well, then you really don't got a whole lot of friends. I don't know exactly what they're following. But anyway, so what we have to do today, and what I believe is going to happen this year, is you're going to open your mouth. The Bible says this about your mouth. He says it has the power of life and death. The times that you don't speak and your child is dying, and I don't know in what way, or your marriage is dying, and I don't know in what way, your finances are dying, and I don't know in what way, and your soul is dying, and I don't know in what way, you need to speak to the situation because God's kingdom is arising in you and you have the authority of life and death. So instead of just letting your things in your life die by not opening your mouth, why don't you begin to open your mouth and speak life? See, this is the only way that I know these things. And I'm reminded, is the word, every time I get that manna, it's like, no, Ray, I know you don't want to say nothing. No, Ray, I just want to avoid those conversations. But you can't do that. If you don't confront things, some things are going to run you over. Some of us have been living in places where there's many earthquakes. In, in Asia, there's this thing, it's called the, 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 um, the something rim. What do they call it? The, I think it's called the Pacific Rim. But anyway, it's a, play, it's a rim of fire. That's what it's called. The rim of fire. And that has some of the greatest seismic activity. That means there's volcanoes everywhere. And when these volcanoes shift, the earth shifts. That's called plate tectonics. And there's seven big cross pieces that come and they collide. And all of a sudden, the, the molten lava shifts and shakes. And all of a sudden, there's earthquakes. And not only are there earthquakes, but in the Pacific Rim or... The, whatever I called it earlier, the ring of fire, there's also tsunamis. So that's the byproduct of earthquakes underwater. So I want you to know something about your life today. That your life has had a lot of earthquakes. But if you're not careful, there's a tsunami that's going to collide with your life, a situation, a circumstance, that if you're not ready, it's going to wipe you out. The only weapon against that is the word of God and your, your ability to not be afraid and to speak. And don't shut up anymore. Don't stay quiet anymore. Don't tolerate it anymore. Don't accept it anymore. I don't know who I'm speaking to, but there are certain things that you've tolerated. I don't know. For some people, it's jobs, right? And there's a shifting of careers. Thank you, Jesus. And God is shifting some people up. And you know who you And there's more than, more than a handful of people in this room that God is shifting your seasons in your careers. Thank you, Jesus. And others of you are still in the hallway of destiny. Come on, God. And God says, just keep knocking. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. And what does God say? Speak out. Don't what? No. Don't be silent. But I like that. Don't be silent. Guys, just it's true. Sometimes it is wise when you have nothing nice to say. Get it. Don't say nothing. Go to prayer. Speak in tongues. Do whatever you got to do to get right. 
And when you know your rights and you have some peace and you're calm about a situation, then you can deal with it. But if you deal with it in the flesh, you're going to have a hot mess on your hands. But if you will get in the spirit, you'll read the word. You know how I got to know God? The word. How did I get to know the word? Through word searches. Every single time I had an issue with my heart, an issue in my life, that's the word I would look up in the Bible and I would research it. And I would read every scripture that had to do with struggle, every scripture that had to deal with pain. And I realized just how much I had in common with God and God had with me. I realized that there was hope in the midst of my mess. That's the beauty of Psalms. The book of Psalms is, is where God, where David gets to connect, the shepherd boy David and the King David gets to connect with his heart and God's heart and they collide and he opens it up. And the word of God will open up your heart. It's such a beautiful thing when we read the word of God because it doesn't just feed your life, it feeds your soul. So don't be afraid, speak out and don't be silent. Such, uh, that is a word for somebody today. You better just, you can highlight that and keep that in your, in, in your notes and look at it every single day. Some of us, we need to look at that every single day. Let's keep going. For I am with you. Write that down. Who's with us? Who's with you? Okay, so God's with a few of you. That's good. How many, is God, how many of you have God with you? Who, who know, who's a friend of God? Okay, a couple. All right. Guys, can we get excited? Okay, if, okay, let me tell you something. There are millions of angels that 24 hours of day, and they are not normal angels. They're warring angels. All they do when they're not fighting is they worship God. Those guys are worshiping 24 hours a day. I want you to know something. We should probably take our lessons from them. When you're not fighting, and sometimes even when you're fighting, you got to be worshiping. Worship through the fight. Praise God in the mess. Praise God. Pray to God. Connect with God all the time. And you'll have victory in that situation. So God gives us a promise in, this, in verse 10. He says, for I am with you. No one will attack. There is a lot of people in this room today that you're waiting for someone to attack you in a situation that's not going to attack you. Amen. Some of you have looked at an illness overtaking you. And God says, that's not going to take you out. It's going to build you up. You feel like it, you're a goner, and God says, no, you've been forgiven. We have to really understand this. God says, I am with you. No one will attack you. Not somebody, not if somebody. No one's going to attack you or what? Harm you. Guys, there are situations where you think that there is going to be physical harm to you, and it is all in your, your head. You know the 50% of Christian books are about the battlefield of the mind? The devil's like, Christian, I don't even got to mess with you because your head got you all jacked up. You don't even, wait, as long as you don't make it out of your head, I don't have to worry about it because you're all messed up up there. So for us today, what God is doing in 2024 is his kingdom is arising in us. We're getting our heads right. We're getting our hearts right. Guys, but it starts with the heart and then the head. See, religious people have their head right, but their heart's wrong. That's a disconnect. God wants to infiltrate not just your mind. He wants to get to your heart. The people that go to heaven, the people that make it through the, the pearly gates, that are the people that allow God not just to touch their minds and to transform them and renew them, but people that really surrender their hearts to God. It says, for many people in this city belong to me. I love it. Name it and claim it. God's like, I want you to know something, Paul. You've given up on them, but I never will. See, as much as you might give up on people, and there's, sometimes there's people you need to give up on. Hear what I'm saying? This is not going to be a very popular Christian conversation. <laughs> Some people, for certain seasons, it's no longer your job to minister to them. Amen. It's God's. you got to get out of the way for God to get in the way. But that's hard for us to understand. Because we want to believe in a God that just is going to use us specifically to save everybody. I want you to know something. One thing that I've learned in serving God is that you may be called to everybody, but you're called to reach somebody. We're called to reach the world for God, but there's someone that's actually been assigned to you. Someone that when you tell them, I'm going to pray for you, they're going to say, really? Would you really? I didn't think that. And they're going to completely listen and trust what you say. God assigns people to you, people that open doors, butlers, people that open doors of destiny, people that open doors of salvation, doors of, of favor. But that requires us to let go so that we can let God. Let's keep going. 
So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half teaching the word of God. Okay, do not move yet. This is so cool. We're not even going to make it to the book of Psalms, and that's fine. We don't need to do it today. This is a whole lot, <clears throat> way more than expected. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half teaching the word of God. I'm going to say that one more time. What did Paul do? He stayed there for the next year and a half. That's 18 months of his life. I don't know how, exactly how many days that is. It's, a little, it's half of 365, and you can figure out the weeks, and you can figure out all the 26 weeks, right, roughly. And we can figure out the days, the hours, the minutes, seconds. That's great. What's amazing, though, is that Paul had, was, had committed to leaving. And what did he do when God showed up? He stayed. That's faith. To stay when everything inside of you wants to leave. Those are some of the hardest seasons in your life. Is when you stay when it would have been easier or seemed to be easier to leave. That's faith. That's guts. Paul did what God needed him to do, not what Paul wanted to do. I want you to know that this year you're going to do things that God needs you to do, not things you want to do. But he will give you your wants as you do what he needs you to do. Wow. How amazing is it that Paul is like, yo, I am done with you guys. The blood is on your hands and on your kids' hands for generations, innumerable. And he says, but then God says, no, 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 I'm not done. Now that you got out of the way, now I can get to work. And God gets to work. And what does Paul do? Instead of leaving, he stays. As much as I ask you to let certain people in your life go, and I do believe that you need to pray, come in agreement, and God will confirm. But in some situations, God's not calling you to leave. There's some relationships that God's saying, you got to stick it out. I don't know who that is. I don't know if that's a career path for some of y'all, that you need to stay in a certain job a little bit longer, a certain situation a little bit longer. I don't know. God does, though. But you have to understand, sometimes there's more power in the staying than in the leaving. There's more power in your staying than your leaving. I don't know. I know this is a word for somebody because I can feel it in my spirit. You have had every reason, every legal right, every spiritual right to leave, but you've stayed because God is not finished. Amen. Let's keep going. Amen. 12. But when Galileo became governor of Achaia, some Jews rose up against Paul and brought him before the governor. Okay, I don't even need to read this part. We already know what I read earlier. God had promised Paul, stick it out, love them for 18 months, and no, nothing is going to happen to you. Nothing is going to harm you. Nothing can come against you. Nothing will stand against you. So what happens is that this next portion of Scripture, all it taught us, all it showed us, is that God was faithful to his word. I want you to know something. We don't have to read. We don't have to hash this out with this rabble rouser that had these issues with Paul and tried to set him up in the, in before the governor. of this. That doesn't matter. All that we have to see is that God is faithful to protect his people. If God has given you a word today, now we can stand up. We're going to wrap this thing up real fast. <clears throat> it's crazy how things will just shift so fast. But praise the Lord, that he just did. Just close your eyes and listen. I'm going to pray for two groups of people today. For the strength to leave to those who need to leave and the strength to stay for those who want to leave but God hasn't called you to leave. God, I just thank you that we would utilize in each of your manna the word of God. This is not a manual to beat us up but to build us up. It is the greatest love affair, the love, greatest love novel. I'm not sure how to articulate it. It is the most passionate commitment that has ever existed or will ever exist, the love for God, for his creation. I, someone today needs to know that you are loved. Doesn't matter what you did or didn't do. You're loved. That's why this man is here today. So that you, when you forget, when situations get hard, you can open up this beautiful, beautiful treasure trove, the promises of God called the Bible. 